This is the Umbrella Academy podcast on TV podcast industries, and we're discussing the Umbrella Academy Season 2, Episode 6, A Light Supper. You already know how this is going to go. Daddy's going to play all his little mind games on us, get into our heads, and he's going to turn us all against each other. You watch. Luther, we're not 12 anymore. All right, we're grown-ass men and women. Hey. Hey. We can handle him. You want to know what's different this time? I don't know what's that. You got me. We go in there as a united front. No more number one, number two bullshit. Now on, it's... Team Zero. Team Zero? Team Zero. All the way. Welcome back, fellow Brolly Dollies. This is TV Podcast Industries, and we are on to episode six, A Light Supper, which is part of the second season of the Umbrella Academy. I am one of your hosts, John. Welcome back, fellow Academy alumni. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. (laughs) And rounding out this trio, and I'm somewhere in between, we'll call them uh, Academy Dollies. Brolly alumni? (laughs) Brolly alumni, if you want. (laughs) Welcome back, I'm Chris. Yes, we're back. And of course, after all our talk of cherries on top, seasoning, and all the condiments in between, we are here for a light supper, uh, which is apt, I think. Uh, (laughs) That was our discussion in episode five of the show, just in case you didn't get a chance to listen to the end of episode five. (laughs) (laughs) I I had a lot of salt bay, salting, and Mm peppering all over our discussion. You really did. You really did, Chris. Remember fellow Broly Dollies, uh, you can subscribe and check out our podcast over on our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. Uh, if you want to, you can also support us through Patreon at patreon.com forward slash tvpodcastindustries, where you'll get the episodes slightly ahead of time from our main feed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so please, in any way you see fit, you can support us. Uh, but I think <laughs> with that little public service announcement, uh, on to episode six, A Light Supper. Derek, who directed and wrote this episode? Mm-hmm. The episode was directed by Ellen Curris. Uh, she's a cinematographer by trade, uh, mostly. Um, cinematographer on such awesome movies as Summer of Sam and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, one of my favourite movies of all time. Cinematography in that is fantastic as well. So uh, great to have Ellen over here working as director on uh, Umbrella Academy. Yeah, great to have her here. Definitely, uh, really good. Uh, two of my favorite films. Uh, absolutely, uh, great to have someone sort of coming from that movie background into uh, the episode. Mm-hmm, absolutely, yeah. the episode was written by Erin Michelle Williams, directed some of her own short films that she wrote. But uh, this is her first writing job. Good stuff. Yeah, we seems we're getting a lot of uh, uh, people in the writers' room kind of cutting their teeth here, mm-hmm. and it it doesn't show. This is it's fantastic front to back in a lot of these episodes yeah. so i'm really enjoying this mm-hmm. and, and interestingly on this show what we're seeing is teleplay by uh as the credit that the writers are being given on the show because there is a writer's room uh for umbrella academy so everybody getting their credit for their episodes as being broken by them or fixed or put together by them but there is a writer's room here so uh so yeah. that's an interesting touch um but we do see a lot of the directors that have been on board are people that are uh, from the Netflix stable. Netflix really being seen as a studio now where they have a bunch of actors and a bunch of directors coming into their various shows. Uh, one character, I, I only noticed it because we finally did watch The Irishman this week. Uh, one actress that's in The Irishman also appears in this show. Uh, the actress who plays Sissy uh, played Robert De Niro's daughter in The Irishman. So, uh, two, so she's kind of moving between Netflix projects. So, oh, excellent. Yeah. Glad to see the crossover. Yeah, yeah. The, the cross contamination or pollination. Pollination, yes. Depending. Yeah, it does feel like an old school studio now when you see some of the Netflix productions. You see a lot of them back to back and you see uh, directors Definitely. and writers moving back and forth between all of them. So uh, interesting stuff. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for this episode? Sure. Alison gives Ray a peek at her powers. Dave visits Klaus's compound and the handler offers five a deal. As the siblings meet their father, for a light supper. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, continuing the uh, trend of having kind of origin stories at the beginning of each episode. Uh, this episode kind of kicks off with Alison's origin of her arrival in the 60s and uh, her living in the 60s. So uh, I really like that she goes through that whole uh, kind of backstory and the way the kind of mechanism they're using for that is her telling Ray all about her powers and all about what happened to her since she arrived. And she doesn't skimp. She tells him everything, doesn't she? She tells him all about yeah. what's going on. Yeah, and and he doesn't believe no. her. No, exactly. He asks her to prove it, mm -hmm. um, for sure. And you kind of get a dark and light side to uh, her use of these powers. Yeah. Firstly, uh, she gets Ray a wonderful wardrobe from a, a a shop that doesn't allow blacks into the shop. Yeah. Um, so she she rumors the the owner of the shop, but then we see her back at the diner where they had the sit in protest. And, uh, she, she kind of shows, um, the, the darker side where she keeps telling, uh, the, the guy behind the counter who is the one that keeps pointing to the sign whites only is yeah. the one who I think tips coffee all over, um, Allison. Yeah. Uh, he just keeps pouring coffee and it spills out over to his, onto his hand. Uh, and Ray is having to tell her to, to kind of stop. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really like that. And, and you're right as well. It is this kind of the backstories coming in at the start of each of the episodes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and really importantly that they did this thing. We talked about it back in episode three, I think it was, where we talked about Alison not using her rumor powers to fix every problem in the world because that, that's not a hard one problem. You haven't won anybody's mind and heart if you tell them this is what they have to do and then they do it. So kind of has to show it in the show. You know, again, rem remember the show is aimed at a different audience, a, a much younger audience than some of the shows that have dealt with these types of topics uh, over the course of the shows we've covered over the last couple of months. Um, so it probably does have to call out that there is a reason why she doesn't do it in a really good way of showing it here, like as Alison gets angrier and angrier, uh, showing her burning this guy's hand uh, effectively because she's starting to lose control of the powers in a way. Not not lose control, but but this was what would happen if she became all powerful and used them to solve everything. She could go way too far, yeah, you know. Absolutely. The the other interesting kind of little addition to her powers that at least I caught in, in this was the fact that once she has rumored the 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 person, then she can speak again without saying um i heard a rumor mm -hmm. to to do other things or continue doing what she's already done That's right. which i thought was kind of interesting because i i kind of felt up till now it was always that she was having to say i heard a rumor yeah and so yeah. if she was like with the the guy pouring the coffee um it was just say more she would just say more and exactly. it kept pouring so uh, a slight little um sort of addition i suppose yeah. to that yeah. that power of hers yeah yeah and i we called it early in episode one when we see them event the avenger style fight where they had all seemed to have amped their powers slightly mm -hmm. um this seems to be that their powers are amped they're just not aware of yeah it. absolutely so like vanya's a control diego's additional control uh on the bullet spinning um when he's like when he spins around the bullets, yeah. we can see additional control of the knife flick later mm -hmm. on at the dinner table. So it seems that they're all getting additional control, yeah. if you will, or them through them losing control, they're getting they're being open to additional power. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I don't really want to uh, keep going dipping back into the comic, but I just want to mention again that Alison's power in the comic is very powerful um it's it so kind of the way they're taking it in the show where she says words and people follow what she says is one aspect of her powers in the comic books it is very much she can say you know i i heard a rumor you have a can of coke over there and the person the can of coke will appear into existence you know that's yes. that's part of her power whatever she says comes true whereas here it's whatever she says to someone they must do is kind of the 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 way it yeah. plays out in the show so um so it is massively power in the, powerful in the comic books here it is massively powerful just in a different way yeah absolutely yeah, agreed so chris um what is your big moment from episode six so really it's the continuation of the bad guy scene in episode five mm -hmm. it is uh basically of the culmination of handler and five having their discussion where they sent lila off to a corner mm -hmm. um and we see why the handler was 
asking Lila to keep Five alive because she needs something from Five. We find out that um, essentially the uh, commission is run by the board and once a year they meet. Uh, only time, we're not sure who the members are or anything like that, but once a year they meet in a different time, in a different place, mm-hmm. and essentially the handler wants Five to kill them. He was one of their best assassins as the commission, so she wants the, him to kill the board um, and essentially so that the handler can be in control, so the handler can, who doesn't mind um changing time a bit mm-hmm. she doesn't mind um kind of knocking things around because and she says she was towing the company line in the previous season uh saying that the apocalypse in 2019 had to happen uh-huh. she can fix it she does she can send them back she can get all of the umbrella academy back to 2019 and they don't have to uh have caused the apocalypse yeah. she can fix the apocalypse then do we believe the handler at all here? No, <laughs> not at all. She just wants control. Yeah. This is, we see throughout this episode that she is basically two timing everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so she has got the Swedes going after the Umbrella Academy. She's got five going after the board. She's pitting the Umbrella Academy against the Swedes. Um, she's playing all angles yes. and it will blow up in her face Absolutely. at some point i just think we haven't seen any evidence at all of her making an offer that she's kept as such no is there any is there any point that you can think of there's there that she like she made an offer to hazel hazel shot her in the head because she didn't stand by it um she keeps telling people that you know a couple more jobs and then you can go off and live your life in a perfect perfect place that was the offer all the way throughout season one if anybody who did the jobs that she wanted them to do could then go off at any point in time and live out the rest of their lives, but nobody got to do that. Um, so yeah. this offer to five, yeah, I can see why he's skeptical to begin with and why he's looking for other options for other people that could help him out, like, like his father. Um, because there's no evidence that she will, uh, she will allow this. And also, I definitely don't believe that the, uh, that the apocalypse is supposed to happen in 2019 is okay and just can be waved away because she says so. There's a big reason why it has to happen. So let's, let's see what, uh, yeah. what the actual offer is from, uh, from her. But, uh, I did like it. I liked her description that, uh, especially when she asks five, you know, uh, do you like jazz five? <laughs> and he responds exactly like I would with, I'd rather lick a cheese grater than listen to jazz. And <laughs> I, like, I like that kind of reaction from, but that's her description of what she would be like as a leader of, of the commission. She would just allow things to flow the natural way and whatever way they go, she's fine with can't imagine that she's the handler she wants to be in control i can't imagine that's anything like jazz well she kind of sexfully also says once i'm in charge we can riff uh jazz (laughs) yeah really good i I do think that uh, you hit the nail in terms of not keeping up to promises i do feel that there's going to be a promise she has made to lila Mm -hmm. uh, and that will culminate probably along the diego lines which is look uh, cause she, we see her in the bingo hall, mm-hmm. uh, essentially talking to Lila again. The topic of five comes up, the topic of Diego comes up. Uh, and you can see that D- Lila probably doesn't want to do this to Diego. So I think that plus with the earlier conversation, I think it's, it means that's where that rift will start to come. Mm-hmm. And that's where Lila will do the, the, the slight trope of bad girl becomes good girl. Yeah, yeah uh, definitely. I, mean, I can see the writing on the wall, but I don't mind it too much if they do it in the right you way. Can, you, you can see the uneasiness, though, with, yeah. with Leela for sure um, at in the bingo hall. And um, I also just wonder whether that flashback of Leela that we got in episode four, whether that is kind of an adulterated type of flashback that could be coming from the handler and so yes it may be that number five was there but maybe he didn't kill um the two people that she's describing it in a way if it maybe. were to be him and maybe the truth will out so right. i i was kind of just wondering about that but ultimately you know in that bingo hall we she's kind of laying out her plan here that um you know number five if he takes her offer is this scapegoat so that she can have plausible deniability for when the revolution comes. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, she, as you say, she is a lady not to be trusted at all. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, so that's really my big point for this. And then we do see at the very end of this episode that Five takes the deal. He is given, he, he meets the handler in her hotel room. Um, he says he'll do it. And we do see that, um, the handler gives, um, Five a, a, a piece of paper, a slip of paper with the, where the board will be. And he has to jump forward in mm-hmm. time. And actually, I've been saying 1983 for a long period of time. Actually, it's 1982. Mm-hmm. So f- forgive me on that. <laughs> I can't remember the exact, I didn't write down the exact location of the place, but, uh, yeah, 1982. So he has to go forward in mm-hmm. time. So what we'll see now, I think, is five for the remaining for the next, like, two episodes or stuff. Uh, stuck in ninth, stuck in this forward time. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe that might be that might yeah. be the way to go. Yeah, um, hopefully some of our academy alumni did write down the name of the uh, place that he has to go to. <laughs> hopefully, well, let's hope. Yes, absolutely. John, for, for some unknown reason, some unknown reason, indeed. Uh, wait till the end for our pub quiz, and you might know. Uh, John, do you want to give us your big point for this episode? Yeah, my big point is actually it's a bit of fallout, really, um, from. Uh, the handler's duplicitousness, I suppose. Um, and that is that Elliot gets uh, quite a lot of dental work. Oh, yeah. um, and it's really, really uh, gruesome. Mm-hmm. Like, um, be- because of the, the the setup with the the landmine um, or, or the claymore uh, that kills one of the Swedes, and linking that to Diego, we do have a classic moment. Uh, it's the Swedish sauna, um, <laughs> where there's a lot of Swedish being talked, uh, and it ends up with sort of unharmed wieners in the end. And by that, I don't mean the dog. Um, it's another great scene with Hilarious. the Swedes yep. um, and uh, with the handler there as they are, you know, slapping birch branches on their back. Mm-hmm. There is luckily just the right amount of um, mist within the sauna so that all the um, sort of the, the, the bits aren't exposed. Yep. And um, yeah, we, so... This... I actually would say, to be honest, in fairness to the director of this, I think it's hilariously the right amount of steam that's in there. <laughs> it it's really like, is. It's like, you know, you, ha- you could have a little bit less, you know, a little bit titillation in the scene, but absolutely not. This is supposed to be like all the steam is from the neck down on everybody in the room. <laughs> it really uh, is. Really, it's, it's really funny. Um, but ultimately, they're given uh, the location of where Diego is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the one word that without the subtitles, they did understand was uh, Diego, yeah. uh, and uh, <laughs> and we have here then um, the Swedes catching up uh, with Elliot, uh, trying to find out where uh, Diego is. And my goodness, it is really, really gruesome. I mean, even just the fact of tooth extraction mm-hmm. uh, without anaesthetic uh, makes me oh. kind of want to sort of curl up into a ball and rock uh, gently from side to side. Mm-hmm. Um, but. The remains of Elliot in his father's dental chair uh, with many dental implements stuck into his face uh, and with fewer teeth um, is found by Diego uh, and Luther with the ominous uh, words of ogre for ogre, uh, an eye for an eye. So will this escalate uh, things between uh, the Academy of Seven and uh and the Swedes, but certainly I will miss Elias. Um, I really wish they hadn't, uh, dare I say, killed him off um, by episode six. Uh, It it was certainly a pretty gruesome way to go out, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm hoping five will jump back in time and save him because we do have a really interesting uh, suggestion from his father, Sereggi, about in order to control his jumping, that he should maybe work on seconds or minutes. That's right. And I'm just wondering, yeah. can he do something where he goes back uh, to prevent Elliot from walking up those stairs? Mm-hmm. I doubt it. But nonetheless, um, it's a shame Elliot has got to leave. I, I've liked his light relief. Um, I loved his little, uh, you know... With each one of the the seven, he's just been really good. It's kind of that outsider's yeah. perspective. Yeah. Um, but yeah, dental work gone horribly wrong oh, for right. Elias. Yeah, I think I think the moment when that scene came on, when you heard 
as you're arriving home, you, you're just going, oh no, when he sees the stray cat in the, in the center of his, of his upstairs area and you're going, uh oh, this is not going to go well for Elliot. It's, it's really sad because I think as a character, you're right. He has been really interesting to have in the background of all the episodes yeah. as effectively his upstairs apartment in the now closed down electronics store because he's gone a little bit crazy trying to find the, <laughs> yeah, the, the academy exactly. members. But as it starts to become more and more of the base for the Umbrella Academy, you know, there's more and more people coming in. His bed was taken away when Diego was staying there with, with Lila, you know, they, he lost his bed. And then we have Luther coming over and Luther's taken the couch and five's there as well, you know, and then everybody's coming to the house to meet. So his whole life was completely taken over by the obsession that he had for the three years since he first saw Klaus arrive in that alleyway outside. Ab- absolutely. So um, it's, uh, it's really sad that they've killed him off in this way at this point in the series. Definitely. I mean, I, I think the, the, the great thing about this whole sequence from the sauna through to the Swedes catching up with Elliot uh, with these characters is that um, ability by the writers and what this show does, as we mentioned before, about cutting um, comedy with tragedy or pure in this case pure gruesome mm-hmm. uh and, and yeah. violence and it, it it's it's this dark comedy in a sense that it, it is there uh all all around this but it, it never fails to it doesn't take away from then something like this for a, you know a character that certainly i've really enjoyed yeah. so um yeah i thought uh needed to give elliot um his his spot in the light, um, or, or the dental light, in fact, well, should I say? Yeah. Um, so maybe a clue for the um, the pub quiz question as well. Maybe, yeah. Is it okay? I, I may have two okay. pub quiz questions. I clearly haven't seen your pub quiz questions for this week. Uh, it may not be a real pub quiz question, okay? But nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> but. So then, that is your top point. Derek, what's your top point for this episode? Well, you've left me with the biggest point of the episode, guys. Um, the meeting I of know. Reggie and his family. It normally doesn't happen. I normally get small points because I'm, because I normally go last. Um, but yes, the meeting of Reggie and the family. I really like it because they clearly go there with ulterior motives. And I love how the family play off each other. Everybody wants to be the one to tell Reggie how horrible a person he is or to show them how great they are. And five just wants to get him to help them out stopping the apocalypse you know five is absolutely the most rational one in the room but i really like just the touches of what's going on as they're as each of them are showing off their powers and it's going really badly for them (laughs) it really is you know we do have diego throwing the uh throwing the knife you mentioned earlier on john as it curls around the head of sir reggie when he's showing off his powers the first one i think he shows his power it was and reggie responds going well that's two as in you've you've thrown knives at me and missed me twice and he takes a note in his notepad (laughs) so uh, it's really really harsh you have vanya using her powers slightly more control but still explodes the fruit bowl across the entire table covering everybody in fruit you can kind of get the reaction from everybody going well at least you didn't blow up the planet this time you know but i guess that's a bit better you know um the absolutely awesome allison using her power to rumor uh diego to punch himself in the face (laughs) uh, which he does instantly in a too hilarious fashion as well absolutely like diego actually comes out of this um slightly more kind of sort of back in himself again. I mean, we we get the stammer back as well. Whereas, you know, going into this uh, meeting with his dad full of confidence, it's like, forget the numbers from now on. It's team zero. What a great thing um, (laughs) that you say is there, Mm -hmm. you know, this united front against uh, their dad. Um, So I, 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 I really felt sorry for for Diego Absolutely. here because his stammer even returns yeah. again yeah. as he as he has tears running down his face, being told by his father that he's useless again. Even though this man doesn't know who he's, that he's the father of these kids, he still takes it out worse on Diego than on anybody else. And Diego was the one that really yeah. feels the pain of it. Like, yeah, yeah. He, I think he says, you know, that delusions of grandeur. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Diego taking kind of the leadership position almost because he's not being listened to. Uh, Luther 
then takes that on board as him being ignored as he as he has been for so long by his father uh stands up rips open his shirt and goes look what you did to me showing off his uh his uh chimpanzee chest or his ape chest to his to his father who will have no idea what that's supposed to mean at all other than this is a very big man with a very hairy chest why is he blaming it on me um and finally then it's Klaus not really showing his power but ben basically emerging through Klaus to show off his power but to their father it effectively looks like this drunk guy walked into the room and is going crazy in front of him that's a kind of it so all of them really fail at using their powers to impress their father um remember he still had that opinion of luther when he met him first going you couldn't possibly be my child because of the type of person that you are so i don't think any of the rest of them assuaged his opinion there no with the exception of possibly number five well he gets rid of everybody else realizing that five is the only person there that has got a uh, brain on his shoulders so uh, so the whole plan of the family to uh to kind of get their own back on the man that treated them so badly over the years didn't really work for them at all no it did yeah. not um the other the one bit i did want to just call in there is uh, first of all diego that scene oh god that killed mm-hmm. me um that was just that that was heart-wrenching um yeah, yeah. but ben taking control of Klaus. Previously, Klaus has just told them Ben didn't can't travel ghost didn't travel through into the past. Mm-hmm. So they now know Ben is there, question mark? I guess so. I guess so. Unless like, Klaus explains it away in a different way. Yeah, because Klaus was doing yeah. that thing again to say, I'm not gonna say you're here. Yeah. You know? Again, yeah. really dip shitty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, for me, this is, I, I think that they potentially in the next episode, in episode seven, they will ask, is actually Ben with mm-hmm. us? And then he'll have to say, yes, he is. And I've been mean to him. Yeah. yeah. I, I also think as well with Diego, it feels like he is now ready for the world to burn. Um, you know, he feels a little betrayed by his brothers and sisters, uh, where he says so much for Team Zero and mm-hmm. um, felt that no one was really having anyone's back in the and they all got got shot down, as you say. Uh, but then he does tell Grace about Sir Reggie and the the twelve and his notion as well. Even though Number Five is still saying to him, "You're jumping to conclusions." Yes, it doesn't look great, but we absolutely don't know for certain that he's trying to kill JFK exactly, here. Yeah. But that's exactly what he tells Grace, yep. who who's in the car outside of the tiki bar mm-hmm. um, where they go for their, their light supper. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of feel he's maybe chucked a, a little bit of a match into the room filled with dynamite here. I wonder if this affects Grace in some way, yeah. or does this result in her dying and so he creates the the machine version of her uh, it, it's it's difficult to know but uh, certainly it felt like diego was kind of lighting a match uh, to the the dynamite room to yeah, be honest absolutely i did love the scene with five and uh and reggie chatting uh to each other as yeah, equals definitely um, i thought that made a lot of sense because again seeing five as a character being treated as a child so often by people when they see what he looks like he's never really been around contemporaries people of his own age and i love that he kind of starts that conversation with with uh, reginald saying i'm actually older than you are right now and reginald yeah. actually believes it instantly he kind of goes okay well actually you know what let's have a drink together you yeah. know and they have they have a little uh, glass of cognac together which is really cute that they that they do that and genuinely reginald does seem to kind of help uh, at least the mindset of five days he doesn't give him the key to solving the big mystery and key to solving the apocalypse. But he does help him out, as you mentioned, John, this idea that maybe he's jumping way too far. Maybe he's using his powers way too big uh, and should be using them smaller. Maybe jumping in seconds or jumping in minutes or jumping in weeks or days or, y- or yeah, years. Yeah, or building it up even. decades. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, idea that this is something that from episode one, I think, uh, when we first saw the com- confrontation, really, between Five and his father at the dinner table when Five disappeared into the future. Um, from that first moment, all he's been doing is trying to get his father to be interested in his powers enough that he would show him how to use them well, like he did with everybody yeah. else. Yeah. Um, he knows how to jump around a room. He knows how to jump and, and do individual things in this current time zone. But he had a theory that he'd be able to jump in time, and his father never entertained that. Whereas having this one-on-one 
as equals conversation with Reginald Hargreaves in the tiki bar, he actually seems to get some kind of guidance from, which is which is a, a nice little change to their dynamic as well. Well, that's it, and it's a, I think for for number five as well. It's he has known his his father the least amount of time yeah. or, of any of them, yeah. Uh, oh, just yeah. despite being able to manipulate time uh, the way that he does. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also just I think Sir Reggie's. Um, advice to him about being, jumping seconds or minutes and, and building up that power or the control of that and uh, not just going for the full decade or century in one go and I, I like when he just says because so much can happen in a second an empire can be overthrown you can fall in love and and so yeah. on. it's really yeah it's a, it's a really interesting way of of him having that little bit of advice for for number five exactly exactly really good uh one little touch i was going to just save as a note but one little touch i liked um you remember from the comic books chris the way that the umbrella academy themselves travel around the world is in the elevator in the lift that transports them to various places i liked that all seven of the umbrella academy arrive in a lift to go and meet their father and leave uh in the well we call a lift in an elevator at the end. I'm sure that was a reference from the comic books that they're, that they're all stuffed into this elevator. Uh, I think yeah. so too. And the, 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 as part of that, there is that joke around, uh, poor number one, not being able to hold in his nervous <laughs> gas. <laughs> and them all running out. Uh-huh. Um, I love yeah. that. Good. That oh, a good, good fart joke. Who doesn't like it? Who doesn't like it? Exactly. Uh, that's kind of the big points for the episode overall. I'm sure there's a few things that uh, everybody wants to cover, but since you gave me one of the big points from the episode, I'm going to choose another one of the big points that we didn't talk about from the episode. Klaus talking to his followers, uh, the cult, because I, this to me was absolutely a reference to the life of Brian, Monty Python's life of Brian, uh, as you had Klaus coming out and standing in front of his cult yep. and telling them he's a fraud and everybody in the room going, I'm a fraud. <laughs> no, I'm a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> really, no, he's not. He's a very naughty Exactly. Boy. It really yeah. felt like the, he's not a messiah. He's a very naughty boy, uh, from, uh, from life of Brian. Um, really interesting, really fun, uh, fun scene. I love again this kind of battle between between him and Ben uh, when he actually does what Ben wants him to do and then it all fails and falls apart and then he goes in and has the argument again with Ben going um I did what you said I just didn't do the way you said and now that's not good enough for you either you know so they're still battling with each other even though Ben's having a little bit of a more positive influence on Klaus but it's still not working out you know absolutely I love the fact as well that he goes from his room where he's doing his yoga poses in his nappy um or what looks like a nappy um I know it's not but uh, or his underwear and um he goes I'm Klaus and I'm an Alka wrong meeting uh really really good um yeah, that that whole scene was was superb, and it, it contrasts with the other element of Kraus here because he gets visited by Dave, and you feel like they're going to make headway mm-hmm. here, and, and ultimately it doesn't quite go that well. Yeah, um, and I think Dave calls him uh, a peacenik, uh, kind of reference to them being kind of yeah. Russian agents um, trying to get peace instead of continuing the war in Vietnam, right. but also. The interesting thing is, is that actually the intervention that Klaus did in the diner has meant that the timeline has altered yep. already because uh, Dave signed up early. So Klaus is unable to prevent him from going. Now, whether that does anything else to shift other parts of the timeline, um, who knows? But it's, it's net, it's suddenly, I think this is the, you know, this is the first moment where the timeline has been altered in terms of the timing and, and Dave has signed up earlier than he would have done under normal circumstances. Exactly, yeah. So this is kind of the thing about time travel, isn't it? So this idea that he's there to stop a situation from happening and now it actually might happen even earlier than he wanted it to. Mm. Um, yeah. And also, Klaus kind of calls out the fact that he thinks uh, Uncle Brian um Dave's uncle is actually a closet case is a person that is hiding his own sexuality. And that's why he's so forceful to send Dave off into the army. So, so I just thought it was an interesting kind of element that we hadn't seen in the conversation that they had in the, in the diner last time, but potentially this is the reason why he's so forceful about Dave getting out of here and going off to war because he felt exactly the same way before being sent off to 
quote unquote become a man in the army, you know. Um yeah. so I I do love the the argument that Klaus is coming up with with him going, you know, you can absolutely stay here and become a man. You don't have to go and, be, and go into the army to become a man. That's not the thing that you're destined for. Yep, and if you do absolutely. go, you will die. And the response from Dave is very much, well, that's what, that is the risk you get if you go into the army. The risk is you'll die. So, uh, given my life for the country is what I want to do if that's what my destiny is. So there's, as two sides of an argument there, I suppose. Um, uh, it's just the fact that he'll have had to give up his entire life to go into the army forced by somebody who doesn't want him to to be gay like they were basically is the is kind of the idea so um yeah inter- good scenes so. yeah no i i re- i really enjoyed this and i just it's for me is as you guys said what is the impact of this mm-hmm. and also that whole it's been i can't even remember what which tv show it was now we've we've covered a many mm-hmm. but it's all about making ripples in the timeline not big boulders dropping into the timeline of the stream. Yes, that wasn't the TV show that we covered. That's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which you guys still won't have and let me cover it, and it's on its seventh and final season at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's our fault, fault now. Oh there. my goodness. <laughs> uh, what a shocker. So that, that, great, that great terminology is on Agents mm-hmm. of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, which Derek does put spoiler posts up when he remembers uh, over on facebook.com slash group slash TV podcast industries mm-hmm. where we do discuss it when we can. It is really good at the moment. But essentially, they're talking about making ripples and not waves yes. uh, in this time stream. What we're seeing here is they're starting to make waves. They're dropping boulders. Mm -hmm. They've made ripples and that's fine. But these waves, these boulders are what culminate in bringing them, bringing the apocalypse with them, quote unquote. In other words, bringing it forward, JFK being saved, Mm -hmm. the communists kind of invading a few days after, and then it all resulting in the destruction of the world. So it's just interesting to see. Um, That's my big question. What are the other big storylines from the episode as well? Um, Vanya? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so this is a huge ending mm-hmm. for the episode. This was one where I'm, you, you're actively worried that we know what Vanya's capable of um, when she loses control. This is the point she can lose control, mm-hmm. where the husband comes back uh, or confronts yeah. them uh, or beats the wife and that brings the inner rage. We saw what happened when Leonard was uh, destroyed mm-hmm. uh, in the previous season. This is a similar trigger where actually she's even now more uh, head over heels. Absolutely. Um, so it'd be interesting to see. I would have thought this would have come later in the season, mm-hmm. if I'm going to be brutally honest. Um, but it's good to see that they potentially might wrap this in the next two episodes and still leave a good chunk of time for the repercussions of that to happen mm-hmm. in the remainder of the season. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah I absolutely, you know, I, I wonder, is this just going to be the death of Carl? And that will also push Sissy away, uh, from, from Vanya. If that's what happens, if she takes out her power on him, or will it be bigger than that? Will she be unable to control her rage and kill all, or kill all of them, um, in that little house and uh, that little farm that, that she's living in, uh, with them? You know, will it be, that big, uh, another big explosive moment from Vanya, or will Harlan be able to calm her down in time and save the family? Um, you know, I'm wondering uh, all of this stuff as uh, as the two of them are sharing the car and and kissing with Carl, looking on. You know, um, wondering what's going on in the car with his wife uh, and their and their uh, childminder. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, he he doesn't even need to he wonder; knows. he can see it in the yeah, back window. Oh, yeah, we're going to get a Titanic moment. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, yes. Anything else from the episode (laughs) that we haven't talked about, guys? No, I think that's all uh, from me. Yeah. Oh, no, that's all from me. But I just want one final thing. I'm going to do a John on it and just take a tiny bit and say we're finished, but we're not really. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I love you. Really. <laughs> uh, essentially, it's the uh, what the message the Swedes leave for the Umbrella Academy. Oga for Oga. Um, which is Swedish for eye for an eye. I did not think that. It took me a second. I went, I just read the four Oga and I went, oh my God, we got the name of the guy who's dead. Ah, right. No. <laughs> yeah, I thought for a second it was that. And then as soon as I saw Oga for Oga, 
my brain jumped back to Anna McBeal from years ago where we had a dancing baby, a uh, CGI dancing baby going Ooga Chaka Ooga okay. Ooga Chaka Ooga Ooga. So it's actually, I saw Ooga instead of Ooga. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. But there you go. So your brain is going all across the timeline. It's a quick inner working into yes. how my brain works. <laughs> yeah. Yes, what a scary world, ladies and gentlemen, that we are entering <laughs> into. You have no idea. <laughs> but that's all from my notes. But with that, um, Chris, what did you think overall of the episode? I really like this. Uh, it was a bit of a slowdown, um, but strangely not in too bad of a way. Yeah, I don't know. This felt in very much a culmination episode where we finally meet Reginald, where we finally find out the handler's mm-hmm. plan, where we finally get the, the, the end of Vanya's or the, 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 the ending is coming for Vanya's, uh, love affair, uh, all these different things. Um, so I think th- uh, this now then moves us into act three, if you yeah. will, uh, of the season. Um, so I, I read, read, so I did really still enjoy this. I'm finding it again. I bring it up. They they're packing a punch in every episode. The timing is perfect mm-hmm. in terms of there's no downtime. Uh, even the downtime of them standing in the elevator, which may have been cut or in another show or where they showed it and they would have just done kind of cheap dialogue. They, they bring that humor mm-hmm. in it. Um, or into it. So it, it's still really, really good. Um, so overall, I'm still loving this season. We're six episodes in. And I still haven't grabbed my phone yet. So, uh, great two thumbs up and, uh, uh, a fart in the elevator for me. <laughs> Derek, what did you think of this episode? I think, like you say, Chris, culmination episode, this was exactly what I was hoping for. Seeing all of them come together as a, as a team to meet their father is what we've been waiting for for most of the season. We knew Reginald was here right back from the start of the season, and we knew all these uh, various members of the Academy had to get together to, at one point, and finally we have them all together around a table, and it goes horribly, <laughs> which is exactly what you want oh, from yeah. this group. You know, The dynamics between these actors together are so good. We've seen it in so many scenes when they've all been uh, separately working together, but seeing them all around the one table in this one scene, I think is really good. Uh, and having the, the interplay with still this very um, controlling person like Reginald Hargreaves sitting yeah. in the room with all these people going, why are you making me watch these parlor tricks or why are you making me watch these terrible superpowers? Why would I possibly want to see this kind of thing? Don't blame me for your shortcomings. You know, it's exactly what they didn't want to hear from this guy. Every single one of them hears the exact opposite of what they hoped they'd get out of, out of him. They were looking for apologies from a man that doesn't even know he's done the things that he's done in the future. So a uh, really good episode. Really enjoyed that as the central piece that it was all hanging on. And it's been building up every episode to this and, and to be done so well in this episode was perfect for me. I think it's a, I think it's a really good episode. I'm looking forward to more this season. John, what did you think of this episode? Yeah, I really, again, liked um, this. This is becoming a habit for, for this show. Um, I just love the snappy dialogue. Um, I love the, the cadence of the, the jokes uh, and the move between the jokes and the other elements of this, whether it's personal tragedy, such as besetting Vanya and Sissy, uh, or with Klaus and Dave, mm-hmm. even internally with Diego, um, effectively becoming zero in his own eye, um, and reverting back to that stammer, uh, or, or whether it's, you know, it's just really nicely uh, done and sort of with the backdrop of this nuclear apocalypse uh, hanging in the balance. So uh, just really enjoyed uh, all of this. I would give this four and a half unharmed wieners and licking a cheese grater out of five. Um, (laughs) I think uh, it was, yeah, really good. It it is, it's just... um, it's just connecting so nicely, I think, between episodes, yeah. within episodes. Um, yeah, having this, you know, the, the, the big set piece of the light lunch or, or the light supper with Sir Reggie and him effectively shredding everything that they've kind of 
built in this fr- since they arrived in the 60s uh, and in particular Diego was just kind of so well done the you know Leela and the handler uh, you see the handler is working the room so to speak um, and uh, you you have Leela kind of having to sort of maybe just wonder a little bit if maybe she does have to put Diego into her sights, even though she probably doesn't want to. And the Swedes, you know, gruesome, um, but also uh, have their sort of ironic, funny moments with the with the sauna as well. Mm-hmm. And dare I say, R.I.P. Elliot. Absolutely. Let's hope number five jumps on back a few moments uh, so that he can stop you from going up those stairs into uh, your apartment. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, really liking it. It's all about those seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really liking it. So great. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, with that, I think it's about time we jump over to the pop pub quiz. Yes, fellow uh, Brolly Dollies, we are back into the um, carousel bar. Or should I say, no, what on earth am I talking about? We are having a a brandy at the tiki bar Mm -hmm. uh, here at the bar on this bar stool, uh, getting ready for, um, yes, our pop pub quiz. So for episode six, the question is, when and where will the board of the commission meet? To repeat that, when and where will the board of the commission meet? And this is relating to uh, the the deal brokered by the handler with number five mm-hmm. to go back and cause significant damage to the board of the commission that control these timelines yes and um, so yes please send in your answers to feedback at tv podcast industries.com uh, to be in with a chance uh, of uh, the umbrella academy goodies uh, that we have absolutely absolutely yes go on to your netflix pause that scene read the note write it <laughs> write it in an email and email us to feedback at tv podcast industries.com that yeah. is your answer my alternative question for this oh, yeah. was going to be describe the dental procedure performed by the swedes on poor elliot oh no john but but i am thinking probably best not to too soon john it, too soon. yes too but soon. Too soon. fellow brolly dollies if you want to answer that, you get a bonus point. Oh, no, please don't. I have to read Ooh. these answers. Mm, yeah, a little bit of temptation there on the pub quiz. Bonus points. Uh, yeah. Uh, so thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah. uh, hopefully you'll join us for the next episode. Yes, we hope you will join us for the next episode. where We'll be discussing episode seven. But... More importantly, you make sure you stay subscribed to our podcast by heading on over to tvpodcastindustries.com where you can catch us on every good and evil podcast catcher. Or why not jump on to patreon.com slash tvpodcastindustries where just for a single dollar you can subscribe to us where and you get each and every episode early and maybe the odd one or two exclusive goodies who knows we'll be back next time for our discussion of umbrella academy season two episode seven ooga for ooga ooga chaka ooga 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 chaka ooga, ooga. i just got that feeling oh i love that both of you are singing two different parts of the same song that's awesome um yeah, exactly. on that note if there is a note in there somewhere uh, we'll see you next time thanks for joining us again bye Bye. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Brolly Dollies and Academy alumni. Yes, I'll chuck that one in as well. Uh, it's a pleasure, as always, speaking with you, for sure. Uh, remember, keep watching, keep listening, and keep light suppering. Yeah, keep light <laughs> but, uh, suppering. I was going to say lunching, but oh, okay. it wasn't lunch. <laughs> it was it supper. Was supper. Yeah, so exactly. keep suppering. Yeah. Yeah. That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> That'll work. Sure. Bye. Bye. Bye.